we tell of incredible man-made monsters of the deep, embarked on the last great pioneering adventure on Earth. Man has speculated on what lies hidden deep beneath the surface of the sea. Now he need no longer speculate, as he enters once more the mysterious dark world that spawned him 300 million years ago. In an awesome new fleet of deep sea exploration submersibles, he finds himself gaining at last admission to the depths of the world's last frontier. Cabo San Lucas, at the tip of Baja, California, the first of the Calypso's two mini-subs is launched. It is equipped with an interior camera and a tape recorder, so that its pilot, American diver Ron Church, can film and record himself in a twin dive 1,600 feet down a canyon wall with Captain Cousteau. Michel, Ron is coming. How many times? Six minutes. Six minutes. Ulysse! Come on, Ulysse! No, I don't want to. Oh, he's got a lot. The ocean is a vast world, not only unexplored, but neglected. To reap its benefits, as well as to save it from ignorant destruction by pollution, we must try to gain more knowledge of it. And in our new diving machines, we are meeting that challenge. A surface diver releases the mini-sub from the cables that bind it to the Calypso, and Cousteau is free to rendezvous with Church for their deep descent into the sea. For some reason, there is always a concentration of fish life near the edge of the canyon, above the drop-off line, where I was to meet up with Ron. To film the deep journey, in addition to the interior camera and two cameras outside, Cousteau's sub carries a fixed camera on its back. As the subs maneuver into position, Cousteau behind Church, it's the last time they can be photographed by a third party, a diver above, who, as they descend into the deep, must be left behind. Run, run, run. I see you. You are 
Roger. Uh, I will go to the left down slope. Heading uh, northeast. Okay. 400 feet deep and going deeper. Soon they'll be out of the shallows where plant life still abounds and down into a lightless land, less familiar to man than the hidden side of the moon. Six hundred feet. The darkening journey down is met with sudden surprise. In landscape now nearly barren, an oasis for migrating deep sea fish. One thousand feet on the threshold of the least known region of the sea and the mysteries which have long intrigued man's imagination. In 1903, the French film pioneer Georges Méliès conjured up this somewhat romantic portrayal of the wonders of the deep. The sea's treasures are boundless, and as always, to those who dare penetrate her, the sea yields incredible new riches and consummation of the romantic dream. The reality of 1,600 feet beneath the sea. In this world of endless night, sight is of little importance and some of the creatures have become blind. But they have developed an extra sensitivity to touch. In the mini-sub, at this depth, for me, it's like a slow-motion dream. Going down a cliff is like descending slowly a long, endless staircase without touching the stairs. Sand falls flow almost constantly down to the bottom of the canyon. The falls are created by tons of sand manufactured near the surface. We feel alien down here, but exhilarated, for we have embarked on the exploration of a new environment, which for many centuries men have struggled to penetrate and understand. In the fourth century BC, Alexander the Great is said to have been lowered into the sea in a barrel of glass. The painting is 16th century, dawn of the age of invention and diving, and Leonardo da Vinci's untested design for scuba with the airbag worn on the chest. In 1620, the first workable sub was launched, made watertight with leather and propelled by oars. At four miles an hour, it sailed under the Thames. Constructed from wooden barrel staves, the first military sub, Bushnell's Turtle, 
a one-man submersible employed with little success by the Americans in the Revolutionary War. For underwater exploration, all through the 18th century, devices were sought that would enable man to walk and breathe freely on the ocean floor. The Triton featured a candle in a container with air pumped in to keep it alight. Klingert's diving gear, which encased the diver in a cylinder from head to hips, pointed the way to future designers. Hard hat diving, with air pumped from the surface, was invented in 1837 by Augustus Seba. Although long in use, divers could work only in restricted areas, and air hoses and safety lines could entangle or break. In 1942, a design that would revolutionize underwater exploration, the aqua lung. Developed by Captain Cousteau, then with the French Navy, and engineer Emile Gagnon, the aqua lung with its tanks of compressed air worn on the back would dramatically free divers from air hoses and safety lines. We first tested the aqua lung in the summer of 1942 on the French Mediterranean coast with my friends Frédéric Dumas and Philippe Taillet. At that time, we had no idea how it would change all our lives. Later on, we would add new sophisticated equipment. But the important thing was that now the diver was free and safety was in freedom. Men were now able to move weightlessly in the sea with a range never possible before. We could swim across miles of territory no man had known, free and level, with our flesh feeling what the fish scales know. The entrance to the sea and its mysteries was open, but only to depths of 200 feet. Beyond still lay the dark abysses and secrets guarded for millions of years. As Georges Méliès at the turn of this century had fantasized about a visit to the mysteries of the deep, so had he visualized a similarly incredible rocket journey to the moon. And once again, fantasy became prophecy. Apollo 11's manned mission to the moon, subject for controversy. Some scientists had felt it would have been cheaper and less risky to send unmanned vehicles to probe the lunar surface. While John Glenn said, instruments can measure only what we know. Only man has the unique ability to perceive and relate to unknowns and make judgments on them. Neil Armstrong was to prove Glenn's point. In his words, the auto-targeting was taking us right into a football field-sized crater with big boulders and rocks. It required us to fly manually past the danger to a smoother landing point. Here it 
go to con you go to continue power descent. You're a go to continue power descent. Good radar data. We're now in the approach phase. Everything looking good. Then you're a go for landing. Over. I do understand. Go for landing. Deep beneath the sea, there lies a vast virgin territory, every bit as challenging as outer space. In depths too deep for divers, blind probes by instruments lowered from the surface are common. As in unmanned space exploration, research work like that accomplished by the USC marine research ship Valero 4 is essential but has its limitations. It is my belief that no blind instrument can replace the eye and the intelligence in direct confrontation with the whole subject to be studied. Bringing up random samples from the bottom is too imprecise. It's like Martians trying to discover about life on Earth by probing indiscriminately through the clouds. And upon bringing up a puppy dog, drawing significant conclusions about the population of the Earth. Direct observation of the ocean depths was necessary. And in 1948, Cousteau assisted August Picard in the testing of the first bathyscaphe, a vehicle designed to carry men to the deepest part of the sea. A close relative to the early stratospheric balloon, also introduced by Picard, the bathyscaphe design included a gasoline float for buoyancy and a pressure-resisting gondola for passengers. Safely free from any tethers to the surface, the bathyscaphe would pass its ultimate test in 1960 its third model carrying Picard Saint-Jacques and Don Walsh 35,000 feet down into the Mariana Trench, the deepest known spot in the sea. What we needed was a submersible of greater maneuverability than the Bathyscaphe, a ship that would allow us to go deeper and stay longer than with the Aqualung, but giving us the Aqualung's freedom. With André Laban as chief engineer, we built the diving saucer the first submersible of its kind. Exceedingly compact, it had to be light enough to be considered just one more oceanographic instrument at our disposal aboard the Calypso. In 1959, in Marseille, in the presence of the Secretary of the French Navy, the saucer was christened. It was an exciting moment. So much work and planning had brought us to this day. We named the ship Denise, after the wife of Jean Mollard, our project engineer. Care had to be taken that our prize not be damaged, even by a bottle of champagne. So a towel was ordered. For her maiden voyage, Denise would be impeccable. To adjust her buoyancy, everything Denise would carry was carefully weighed before launching. It was in the Caribbean of Guadeloupe that the saucer was to be tested. Pilot Albert Falco enters the miniaturized sub. The hydrojet propelled two-man submersible with its capacity to dive to more than a thousand feet with safety would usher in a new era in underwater exploration. In their pressure-resistant shell, Falco and engineer Molar lie prone, peering through their twin portholes in anticipation of a world denied them as divers before. Like some strange crustacean of the deep, the first diving saucer easily tilts and turns to reveal to its passengers for the first time the silent majesty of the deep undersea world.
when Denise surfaced, Falco staged an unexpected celebration. From the sub's jet nozzles squirted two geysers 25 feet high. Now the way was open for research in the deep waters of the sea, which no man could explore freely before. Today, an awesome new fleet of diving machines has been launched in the wake of the saucer Denise. Built largely by private industry for a wide range of uses, with names like Star 2, Pisces, Necton, Daub, Ben Franklin, and Deep Quest, they are the pioneering work and research boats of inner space. The 51-foot-long Illuminat designed to operate at depths of 15,000 feet, is the world's deepest diving submarine. Literally a deep sea research laboratory carrying a three-man crew. In 1966, the Illuminat with the Navy mini sub Alvin helped recover the lost H-bomb off the coast of Spain. Now the Illuminat's grappling arms will recover a mock-up plane. The Omega is an underwater robot equipped with a television camera and umbilically connected to the surface from where it's remotely controlled. Above, operators are directing its performance under the sea while watching a TV screen. Omega's instructions are to burn through an anchor chain and she is obedient because she's not blind. Her television camera being an extension of her operator's eyes. Beaver is a manned submersible that can lock out divers. It's designed primarily to perform tasks outside its hull. Chief pilot Joe Thompson readies Beaver for a lockout test. The ship is anchored over the diving area while the divers transfer to Beaver's aft compartment for lockout. To see that nothing goes awry, Thompson watches at a viewport as the divers depart. Long umbilical airlines will keep them tied to the ship. The vehicle is moored. Otherwise, the diminished weight would cause the ship to ascend, dragging the divers along. Beaver's rare capacity for diver lockout will afford it a wide variety of work under seas. Close range oceanographic research, scientific data gathering and sampling, as well as construction, assembly and maintenance activities deep beneath the sea. Work test completed successfully. The divers return to the ship. These are the pioneering days for submersibles. Everything is new, and there are many firsts. What the era of the Wright brothers was to aviation, today's submersible is to underwater exploration. Beaver has another capacity, prophetic for the future, the ability to mate with a subsurface structure or habitat for the dry transfer of personnel at normal atmosphere. Now, for the first time in history, we will see a vehicle, unassisted from outside, attaching itself to an undersea station, an operation as difficult as docking in space. Yeah. 
the mating skirt's been sealed to the top of the structure. Something Georges Melies or even Jules Verne could not foresee. For a new diving experience, Joe Thompson on a busman's holiday from Beaver visits the Calypso, anchored off Cabo San Lucas. Good to see you again. Hey, you made it. Yes, I did. Very good trip. Hello, Andre. Good to see you. Hi, Ron. Hello. How's it going? Very good, thank you. You're going to find a lot different flying these little small submarines than those big ones we're used to, right? I imagine so. I you imagine so. I just want the Beaver up to the mini -sets. Calypso's two mini-subs are the descendants of the original saucer. Smaller, lighter, and faster than Denise, they descend twice as deep. For filming on the spot, tape recorders and both interior and exterior cameras are parts of the essential equipment, about which Joe Thompson now learns. Two beautiful spotlights. For the deep water cinematography? Yeah. Then we have a flood here, and the camera case comes here, protected against the sharks. I see. Now the hydraulic nozzles for the jets rotate. And we have a little further, the batteries on each side, uh, the battery tanks which are compensated with oil for pressure. Now for the interior. Fine. Yes, see. Joe, you're familiar with the inside. Uh, yes, and With the drawings. But Let's see. Here, you have the sonar telephone, and then the large electric panel with all the switches and the fuses. So, Joe, under the electric panel, you have the uh, beep tracking device. Oh, I see. Right? With Thompson fully briefed, Andre LeBan will accompany him in a training dive. LeBan in Mini Sub 1, Thompson in Mini Sub 2. It's nine in the morning, and everything's ready for Joe's first dive. Two-year okay? Yes. Ah, uh, good. Good, Michelle. I see you on the bottom. Okay, Andre. Bye. Bye-bye. Oui, Gaston, je t'entends, je t'entends. As he prepares for his launching, Joe adjusts the camera in the sub's close quarters. Our new one-man subs are even more miniaturized than Denise. They're much lighter to handle in launching and recovery. And with two of them, if one gets in trouble, hopefully it can be helped by the other. When he has descended to about a hundred feet, LeBan will drop his descent weight. Riding aboard Thompson's sub is the training instructor, who will supervise this shallow water dive. At the bottom, Joe will be required to check his filming lights, to rotate his jet nozzles, and then by pumping mercury fore and aft, to tilt up and down in a mercury salute. Finally, he is to spin his vehicle counterclockwise and travel.
and another American diver has at least temporarily joined the French team. Could one sub really rescue the other? That was the question. The mini subs had been designed primarily for that reason, and it was time they were put to the test. The canyon of Cabo is deep and narrow, with steep vertical cliffs and overhangs and caves. It would provide us with a properly difficult rescue operation, and Joe Thompson was anxious to take part. We have been designed for that, but we have never made a, an actual test of rescuing one vehicle with another. But the, inter the interesting uh, part seems to be here. That's where it is the steepest. It would be a good drill to do it, let's say, tomorrow, for example. In deep water? In deep water, yes. That's a slight test. Why not? Thompson's job is to hide in a cave and simulate a power failure. It will be Calypso's role to track him and rescue him. In this actual operation, the only underwater cameras are in and on the sub. Uh, Calypso, Calypso, uh, mini sub one. I am going down to 60 meters. Over. 60 meters, Rogers. 60 meters, Rogers. One meter is a little more than three feet. So Joe is at about 200 feet and going down. I am 130 meters deep on the canyon wall. Do you copy? You are in the canyon, depth 130 meters. Bien reçu. Calypso calling Minister Boine. Calypso, calling mini sub one, over. Joe, do you hear me? Do you hear me, Joe? Over. Calypso, Calypso, depth four three zero meters. Four three zero meters. Calypso, I am in a cave. Now Joe shuts off his power. The sub's emergency capacity to ascend rendered useless under the ceiling of a cave. I am in a cave with a power failure. Alors, les Roger, Paul, il faut Cousteau orders out the launches that equipped with directional hydrophones will track Joe's beeps and plot approximately where his sub is located. Then in that area, the rescuing sub will be launched. Andre Lebon receives the instruction to descend and rescue Thompson. It is 7 p.m two hours after Joe's descent. André was not going down for sunken treasure, not for a downed plane, nor a hydrogen bomb. But it was terribly important for our two sub philosophy that his rescue mission work. Cousteau waits for Le Bon to report. Fifteen minutes have passed since his descent. Je suis à 400 mètres. André reports he is 1,300 feet down. He's at Joe's level. Andre maneuvers to locate Joe's sonar beeps. 
The greatest strength of the signal will indicate Joe's direction. And then from his gyro compass, Andre will get a bearing and report it to Cousteau. Now Andre reports he zeroed in on Joe's signal and will start to search in that direction. From Calypso's information, Cousteau calculates that Andre is approximately 160 feet east of Joe's sub. The tracks of Joe's sub. Andre reports he sees the sub in the cave and will now approach it and try to pull it out. Andre must maneuver close enough for contact without damaging his own sub on the cave's ceiling and walls. Now in the unsteadying waters, he must catch hold of the other sub's jet nozzle with his grasping claw. It means the success or failure of the whole enterprise. The connection's been made, but the claw can still slip as Lebon tries to delicately pull the 4,000 pound sub from the cave. Suddenly, Joe's sub jerks forward and it's released. He's free. Now back up to the Calypso, offering a reputable physical proof that the rescue system works. At 9 p.m., four hours after his descent, Joe Thompson returns. Each time Denise was laid to surface, I had waited in agony. Now I need never know that kind of concern again. Oh, welcome back. Hello. Hello, oh, gentlemen. <laughs> How was it? Very good. Different. Quite different. And now returning, in mini-sub 2, André Lebon. Welcome back, André. Wait, I could just barely hear you. Couldn't you hear us at all? Oh, very weak. But no echoes, or? Uh, in the canyon, uh, it's uh, echo. A lot of reverberations. But water are very clear. Clear water, excellent. Good day. 
On the island of Catalina, it's a festive occasion, as Captain Cousteau welcomes an extraordinary assembly of subs, gathered together for the first time for what he calls a deep submersible jamboree. In this new technological field, the pioneers had been working independently. Now we had come together to share our experiences, to exchange our views and compare our techniques. There is still much to be learned, but today's submersible may be as significant to the study of the ocean as the rocket is to outer space. Plans proceed for an unprecedented combined deep dive in which seven submersibles will take part. Star 2, Deep Quest, Necton, Beaver, and Daub, as well as the Calypso's two mini-subs. Now, tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning, conference at 7, launching at 8. Calypso's mini-subs are launched, and the jamboree is underway. Deep Quest with a capacity to dive 8,000 feet. Daub with no portholes but optics and closed circuit TV. Beaver. The fish like Star 2. And Necton. The little yellow submarine, smallest and most maneuverable. All assemble and get ready for the order to dive. All subs, all subs, attention. Five, four, three, two, one. Submarine specialists were horrified at the very thought of these subs going down together in such close proximity. But thanks to the communication by sonar telephone, risks were minimal and the subs often worked with as little as a foot between them, without a single collision or the slightest damage to any sub. right behind star two, over. On the way down, the submersibles briefly disperse, and one of the Calypso's mini-subs discovers an old shipwreck that is unknown to the usual divers of Catalina, because it's beyond their reach. Probably once made of wood, now only the ship's steel structures remain. Star 2 and the other subs suddenly find themselves surrounded by a gathering of squid. This is Star 2, this is Star 2. I'm in a school of squid. Over. The squid are on their way to their mating grounds in the shallow waters higher up. The subs are moving upward too. Led by Mini Sub 2, they are to enter the kelp forest above and come to rest. We are emerging from the era of the sea's romantic mystery into a new time of research and exploration. Soon, most of the mysteries of the sea will be revealed to us, and we will see that the ocean is but an immense extension of man's own world, a province of our own environment. We will have to farm it, mine it, and harness its energies, but we must remember to protect its integrity and its harmony as we make this great voyage of discovery into a once mysterious but still beautiful world. Mini 
mini sub two, mini sub two, is going around you to inspect your formation. Mini sub two is going to move around you to inspect your formation. Please do not move. Please do not move. Over. Never before in the history of man has the need to know and understand the sea been more urgent than it is today. In the words of John F. Kennedy, knowledge of the oceans is more than a matter of curiosity. Our very survival may hinge on it. The ocean's plant life provides us with a large part of the oxygen we breathe. And if in a poison sea, plant life ceased, it would mean disaster for all mankind. We must learn to protect and to love the sea, for the sea sustains life. That is our greatest resource and treasure. These new research subs, these incredible diving machines, will help us better understand the true wonder of the deep. They are the vanguard of a fantastic technology on which the future of civilization may depend. In a forthcoming episode of the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau, you will accompany the men of Calypso on as yet unseen adventures in their three-year worldwide explorations beneath the seven seas. And you will share the personal memories and innermost thoughts of Captain Cousteau as he reflects on why men down through time have answered the call of the deep on the water planet 